In this short presentation, I want to say a few things about research. In particular, I'll look at how we structure our research at MOLA, working between fieldwork and academic research, and what our aspirations are in working the way that we do. I also want to mention our recent forays into providing vocational training for people wanting to become archaeologists, and to touch on the implications of an organisation like MOLA having that whole process under one roof. The start point has to be a little explanation of what MOLA is. In a way, many people will know MOLA as one of the London archaeological units, formerly the field unit of the Museum of London, and with antecedents in London going back about half a century. Since 2011, however, we've been an independent charitable company separated from the museum. Effectively, this means that we now have an extended focus on public outreach, research and education to go alongside the fieldwork. In addition, since 2013, we've been a registered independent research organisation with the AHRC, meaning that we can apply directly to UK research councils for funding for research. The IROs are a group of non-HEI research organisations, including the British Library, British Museum, Historic Royal Palaces, the Imperial War Museum, the Science Museum Group, the National and National Portrait Galleries, National Museums Scotland, Tate and more. IRO status exists in recognition of the fact that nationally and internationally significant research takes place outside academia and that many organisations employ highly qualified and research active individuals with doctoral, postdoctoral and postdoctoral equivalent research experience. IRO research covers the full range of RCUK fundable activities but primarily finds expression in collaborative doctoral study, connecting non-HEIs with universities through PhD study based around their permanent collections or other resources of IROs. At MOLA, we undertake research through three main streams. Firstly, and perhaps obviously, is that research undertaken mainly through planning-led developer funding models as part of MOLA business. Here, as will be obvious to most archaeologists, excavated or surveyed material is analysed, interpreted and researched at a variety of levels, from that necessary for reporting on individual sites through to the occasional larger synthetic research projects. The aims of this research are effective interpretation, suitable dissemination and the connection of material from a range of sites through comparative analysis allowing individual sites and objects to be placed into wider contexts, whether explicitly through research frameworks or otherwise. Our second strand of research is based around outreach and community engagement. Projects where we aim to combine the expertise and labour of archaeologists with the expertise and labour of non-archaeologists in the creation of new understanding of the past and its role in the present. Recent MOLA projects in this area include the Thames Discovery Programme, part of MOLA since November 2011, and CITIZAN, the Coastal and Intertidal Zone Archaeology Network, both of which see MOLA archaeologists working with members of the public in locating, assessing and recording certain kinds of archaeological site. Lastly, we have research that is more intentionally focused on academic connections and less based as a primary impetus at least, on outreach or on the best practice requirements of work on individual sites or objects, although we do with these regularly collaborate with HEIs of course. Here, as would be in the case in an HEI, we aim to produce or collaborate on research that aims to make new ways of doing archaeology, to uncover new places to do archaeology and to find new people to talk to about archaeology. It would be useful if I could draw up a table that showed different kinds of research with different funding streams and different subjects, but maybe even different members of staff um, working in each. But realistically, there are um, huge overlaps between these different kinds of research and their subjects and practitioners. As most researchers will know from their own experiences, we start from the research idea, then tweak that idea, because of the requirements of certain funding bodies 
desired outcomes or available personnel or data. Occasionally we are responsive to calls for particular forms or areas of research. Why does MOLA being an IRO matter? It's important at this point, and especially in the context of this particular um, workshop, to not think about or, or, or make a point of the specific individual contribution of MOLA, but instead to look to the wider IRO model of which MOLA is part. There are some obvious benefits to giving non-HGIs the opportunity to apply for funding re for research funding on an equal footing with HGIs. As mentioned previously, IROs combine access to primary data and collections, personnel with research skills and experience comparable to many academics, expertise in the management of projects of varying scales, and established routes to effective dissemination of the results of research. There may be a tendency to view non-HGIs more as data providers or repositories rather than as researchers in their own right. Indeed that makes up a fair proportion of the approaches we get um, from people interested in research collaboration. But that need not be the case and I hope here really there is um, no need to make any extended case for the existence of IROs or for their access to RC UK funding. What is perhaps more worthy of discussion and something I hope we can pick up on is that IRO research will inevitably have a number of differences to HEI research. The structures of IRO research will inevitably be different as such, a res such research arises from organisations set up with obviously different remits to any university. Within the IRO group, there is regular discussion about the unsuitability of parts of the existing modes of assessment, for instance, of RC UK funded research and its impacts, perhaps even of research models and modes of application. The problem is not that, is not that of newcomers complaining about the way things are, but more that if we can recognise the differences between HEI and non-HEI research, we can develop effective ways of continuing both, giving both not just equal potential access, but genuine equal access on equivalent but differently nuanced terms. Ultimately, we all want good significant research to be done by passionate people. What this might mean for research across archaeology will really play out as non-HGI research in archaeology spreads away from MOLA being an IRO and the countless other ways in which heritage institutions connect with academia, whether through direct organisational connections or through the efforts of individuals. There will be other archaeological IROs in time and how they work together will be really important in making positive changes to the nature of archaeological research. It will do this partly in the research itself and in the results of that research, but also in terms of individual researchers, research training and the way that that can spread across organisations. There is little point in non-HGIs in archaeology engaging in this way with academic research, unless one of our aims is to make non-HGI archaeological organisations a desirable destination for postdoctoral researchers who want to remain research active and not see their time working as an archaeologist as just time out of academia, a negative on the CV, as is often currently the case. It also means that archaeological non-HGIs will develop new capabilities in managing research active staff, begin to offer even more varied forms of dissemination, and hopefully create new kinds of assessment of research that will impact on other forms of non-HGI research as well, and on research in universities. Lastly, I just want to touch on Moller's recent establishment of a vocational training course. In 2015, we took on 10 Londoners to undertake a six month paid archeology span traineeship towards completion of an NVQ and becoming a field archeologist, which a number of those who began the course have gone on to do. The course was run in conjunction with London Borough of Tower Hamlets. 
Without going into details of the course itself, I want to highlight its existence here, and it is not the only available accredited non-HGI training in archaeology field skills, as it puts the whole process of doing archaeology and being an archaeologist under one roof, from training non-archaeologists to become field archaeologists without going through university, to engagement with academic research and everything in between. Of course, the sus sustainability of any particular efforts or of the model as a whole really remains to be seen. However, there is potential here for both increased engagement between academic and professional archaeology and for access to professional archaeology through non-academic routes. I hope we can see the value in both of these and their potential to change the nature of archaeology in a positive way and I look forward to discussing the many interesting issues that arise from this.